Did you know that poultry is the nation's third largest agricultural crop? A three billion dollar business? Yes, chickens are raised in every county of the United States, mostly for egg production. Breeders have achieved great results in boosting the egg output of the average hen. Today's hen averages 154 eggs per year, and some birds produce over 300 annually. But with this emphasis on egg production, poultry meat has been more or less a byproduct of the industry. Relatively few poultrymen took steps to develop better meat-type chickens. During World War II, the industry reaped new gains with the shortage of red meat. Growers were pressed to supply the demand for top-quality chickens suitable for roasting oven or frying pan. Say, that makes me hungry. At the end of the war, poultry leaders were convinced that the industry would have difficulty maintaining its wartime gains. As one solution, the a and food stores, the nation's largest poultry retailers, offered to sponsor a contest for the development of superior meat-type chickens. A national committee was full of the program, the Chicken of Tomorrow, a broad-breasted bird with bigger drumsticks, plumper thighs, and layers of white meat, like the wax model on the right. The committee made plans for a series of state and regional Chicken of Tomorrow contests to end with a national contest in June 1948. a and offered $10,000 in cash prizes, $5,000 for the national champion. State committees were organized by H.L. Schrader of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and farmers and breeders all over the United States were invited to participate in state contests. Two scorecards, each with a value of 100 points, were adopted by the committee. One scorecard was designed for dressed chickens in which major emphasis was placed on confirmation, including factors affecting edible meat yield. The other scorecard was for live chickens with special emphasis on the economy of production. Hundreds of poultry raisers competed in 31 state contests held in 1946. And still more took part in the 1947 contests held in 39 states. Following the state contests in 1947, five regional Chicken of Tomorrow contests were conducted. 25 regional winners and others who ranked high in state contests qualified for the national contest. After considering offers from several state Chicken of Tomorrow committees, the national committee selected the Delaware Agricultural Experiment Station in Georgetown, Delaware, for the raising site. Late in February 1948, 40 finalists and four alternates each sent 720 hatching eggs to Bradley's Hatchery in Easton, Maryland, 40 miles from Georgetown. Unlike state and regional contests, all entries in the finals were hatched and raised under identical conditions and common supervision. The fragile cargo was shipped from 25 different states by practically every known means of transportation. Some West Coast breeders shipped by air, others by rail, and still others brought their eggs to Easton by private car. The Railway Express Agency made special arrangements to handle the contest eggs, and company agents gave each contestant specific routing instructions. Of the 31,680 eggs, only 61 were cracked in transit. On February 28, the eggs were trayed and readied for 21 days of incubation. They were given the regular commercial hatchery treatment, including fumigation and strict sanitation. The trays were labeled with a number replacing the breeder's name. In this way, the hatchery operators, those who later brooded and reared the chicks, the dressers and even the judges, identified the various entries without knowing the names of the flock owners. Once inside the incubators, the trays were automatically turned every three or four hours, the usual precaution to prevent the embryo from adhering to the shell. The temperature was thermostatically controlled and checked constantly throughout the incubation period 
by plant personnel. Humidity also was carefully regulated. Eighteen days later, the eggs were removed from the incubators and transferred to larger hatching trays. These were placed in hatchers for the final three days of incubation. What goes on inside an egg during incubation? Well, after a week, the eye shows up clearly in the embryo as the first external organ to develop. Gestation is much further advanced at 10 days. The chick's outline is more pronounced as other organs begin to form. At 14 days, you can see the shape of the chick. The contents of the egg provide nourishment during the incubation period. Now at 18 days, the chick is almost ready to emerge from its shell. On the 21st day, its sharp beak pokes through to daylight as it seeks its freedom. It's not an easy task. The struggling chick must rest from time to time to muster strength and recover from its exhausting efforts. Finally, with the parts of the shell held together only by shreds of the lining, the chick makes one more super effort and shakes free into a new world. The chicks in the Chicken of Tomorrow contest hatched on March 21st. Of the 12 different breeds and crosses, New Hampshire's and White Plymouth Rocks predominated. Each of the two breeds was represented by a dozen flocks. A minimum hatch of 400 strong, healthy chicks was required from each entry. Poultry leaders praised the hatching results. A New Hampshire flock entered by the Shenandoah Commercial Hatchery, Mowertown, Virginia, led all other entries with a hatch of over 87%. White rock flocks averaged 74%. And one flock of dark Cornish hatched over 73%. Crossbreed flocks at 72 percent. Pretty chicks? Yes, sir. Alike as two peas in a pod. Wing banding looks like an enormous task, but government poultry specialists like H.L. Schrader and college poultry scientists like Dr. R. George Jap clapped the metal tags on the 16,000 birds in record time. Each chick received a band with its assigned flock number and each bird carried the same number for identification purposes throughout the entire contest. The chicks were placed in boxes for shipment to the experiment station in Georgetown, there to begin a 12-week growing period under the supervision of officials of the Delaware Agricultural Experiment Station. At Georgetown, the flocks were assigned to special pens and were housed in two parallel buildings. Four boxes, a hundred birds in each, went into each of the 40 pens, measuring 15 by 20 feet. Peanut shells were used for litter, and in each pen, a coal-burning brooder stove provided the necessary warmth. The day-old chicks soon solved the mysteries of feeding troughs and water jugs. The first two weeks, each pen had four chick feeders three feet long and four one-gallon water jugs. Later, these were replaced by five larger feeders with adjustable supports and the jugs removed in favor of automatic fountains. Adequate quarters, warm, clean, dry litter, ample food and water, that's what the chicks thrive on. And these chicks had the very best in care and sanitation. On warm days, the chicks need plenty of ventilation.
Professor Carl Seeger, superintendent of the experimental station, inspected the contest pens and kept daily records on vital statistics. At six weeks, the flocks showed rapid growth. Cockerel sprouted combs and feathering was well advanced. The feed was a special mash formula prepared by the American Feed Manufacturers Association. It conformed to usual commercial standards containing a minimum of 20% protein, 3.5% fat, and a maximum of 7% fiber. No whole grain or pellets were used. Feed was kept before the birds at all times. It was weighed and records kept on each flock's consumption. This ranged from a high of 4,479 pounds in one pen to a low of 3,775 pounds. There was no lapse in the attention given to the birds, and at the close of the growing period of 12 weeks and two days, the chicks were ready for shipment to the processing plant. Mortality for the entire period was under 7%, remarkable considering the epidemic of poultry diseases that swept through the 40 flocks. Newcastle coccidiosis and infectious bronchitis took the greatest toll. Professor Seeger estimated that Newcastle alone set the birds back two weeks. Shenandoah Commercial Hatchery, whose New Hampshire's had the best hatchability record, also had the least mortality, losing only one and one half percent of the flock. The coops were weighed at Georgetown, and this live weight figure used to calculate pounds of feed per pound of gain. Two flocks averaged 3.17 pounds of feed per pound of gain. California Cornish, New Hampshire's entered by the Van Tress Hatchery of Marysville, California were tops in live weight, averaging 3.57 pounds. And some weighed close to five pounds. On arrival at the Bird's Eye Snyder plant in Pocomoke City, Maryland, the chickens were placed in feed batteries to be watered and fed for three days before dressing. The regular battery diet was given to the birds, and on Monday, June 21, each lot was dressed separately. Cooled and ready for judging, every sixth bird selected as a judge's sample and rated for meat characteristics. Uniformity of size, pin feathers, skin texture, conformation, and other factors affecting edible meat yield. Twelve birds from each of the samples were packed for display purposes. Others went on the eviscerating line. The carcasses were thoroughly washed, prepared ready to cook, and subjected to government inspection. Judging of the dressed birds was completed at Pocomo, and the score of each flock, combined with figures from the live bird scorecard, determined the contest results. On June 24th at Georgetown High School, Visitors from Canada and all parts of the United States saw on the stage an average pullet and cockerel from each flock and a box of dressed poultry representing each entry. Bearing in the prize money, dressed white rocks representing Mrs. H.W. Linhart of Chillicothe, Missouri, had the best skin texture, the least dark meat, and the best covering of fat. New Hampshire's entered by Schenck Hatchery, Harrisonburg, Virginia, showed the best feathering. And White Rocks from the Shalbina Hatchery, Shalbina, Missouri, were tops in uniformity of size. Clyde Cleveland of Blodgett, Oregon, scored first in uniformity of type and color with his New Hampshire's. As a supplementary attraction to the program, the Delmarva Chicken of Tomorrow Queen, Nancy McGee of Berlin, Maryland, she and her attendants rode in a mammoth parade in Georgetown, sponsored by the Delmarva broiler industry. Everyone joining in the festival spirit. And who wouldn't? The Van Tress brothers, Charles and Kenneth, had a double reason to celebrate. Their flock, which scored 159 and 87 one hundredths points out of a possible 200, was first in both feed efficiency and live weight. 
tops in economy of production, and second in the dressed bird scorecard. The birds were developed by crossing red Cornish males on straight New Hampshire females. The Chicken of Tomorrow contest has turned the spotlight on meat production, and poultrymen cite the many benefits derived from the three-year program. In the words of Dewey Termolin, chief of the poultry branch of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the success of the contest proves conclusively that it is possible to breed chickens with superior meat type characteristics. He predicted widespread production of superior meat type chickens within the next few years. The National Committee was so enthused with the results that it requested the ANP to sponsor another three year program. The committee has drafted plans for state contests to be held in 1949 and 1950. A series of regional contests also in 1950. And another national contest in 1951. Today, a California Cornish, New Hampshire leads the field. What will tomorrow's meat type champion be? The 1951 Chicken of Tomorrow contest will provide the answer. Even today, housewives are enjoying improved meat-type chickens. They sure make wonderful eating. Yes, sir, make mine chicken. Chicken of tomorrow, that is.